Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IDA Awards Spotlight Series. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Amy Nicholson. I'm going to be the moderator of today's discussion. And today, we are going to have a great conversation with the team behind our great national parks. Um, before we get started, though, I would really like to land offer land acknowledgement coming from here where I am in Los Angeles. Uh, we're on the unceded land of the Chumash and Tongva people. They have been stewards of this land for generations. I'd also like to say, you know, be sure to check out the rest of our spotlight lineup. We're here at documentary.org slash awards dash spotlight. There's great stuff happening here. And as I'm letting her spell all of that out, I would really like to thank our interpreter for today, Andrea Lost. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're very grateful. And yes, I'll make you spell out that compliment to yourself. <laughs> and now let us welcome the team of our great national parks. We've got executive producer James Honeyborn, and we've got series producer Sophie Todd. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'd love to start just by getting to know you both a bit better. I mean, I know James, you've worked in nature documentaries for nearly two decades. Sophie, you've almost beat him around 15 years. I'd love to know a bit about your background that prepared you for this project. This is a globe trotting monumental documentary that is also existing to serve as, you know, a presidential legacy of sorts. That's a lot. So what did you have with you as skills when you came to this table? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think for me as a filmmaker, uh, the heart of any film is the storytelling. And I think from the very beginning, we had a sense that the, the th themes we wanted to bring forward in, in the series were the same things that mattered to the former president. And that really helped gel everything together in terms of the concept of the series and the way in which we told the stories. I mean, yeah. how soon after President Obama left office did you begin working on this? Um, James, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can answer that. So um, we were introduced to a Higher Ground, the President and Michelle Obama's production company, by Netflix. And that was because we had both joined as sort of creative partners of Netflix at around the same time. And when we, when we met and started chatting, we realised we had a lot of common interests and common ground. Um, you know, it's amazing to think that President Obama has actually protected more wilderness than any previous president in US history. Uh, and so, uh, you know, given that track record alone, we, we felt, you know, this is a really interesting area for us to explore because he has a real authority and authenticity in the space and a great story to tell. Well, yeah, and as the series goes on, I mean, you go, you know, you start in Hawaii, you go to Indonesia, you go to Kenya, you know, these are places that are part of his biography. So it feels like you can feel that this was a collaboration from the beginning, I'm guessing, when you're in the room deciding where to go and what you want to talk about. Well, it's tough. You've got over 4,000 different national parks to choose from. How did we do it, Sophie? <laughs> No, that's definitely true. It, it's it's uh, there's an embarrassment of riches if you like to choose from. But um, yeah, we wanted to represent a whole variety of habitats around the world and reflect that um, national parks are a truly global concept. But as you say, the president's um, biography fed into a lot of the decisions as well and places that he felt a connection to or was passionate about. Uh, and also to see him at home in Hawaii, you know, the place where he spent some of his childhood uh, and talking about his family connections it allowed you to see a different side perhaps of him than has been seen in, on, on tape before. Yeah, he looked very beachy, to be honest, it was startlingly beachy in those opening scenes. Yeah, he's really in his element when he's in nature. He, he's very relaxed and very comfortable. And um, I know Hawaii means a great deal to him. I mean, beyond those locations, how did you settle on um, Monterey Bay in Chile as the other two kind of episode centerpieces? Well, I think, I think Monterey, um, they did, in fact, the Obamas did pass through there on their honeymoon, on their way, and they saw a whale breach, but that wasn't why. Um, I think both of us, James and I, wanted to include some national parks 
where people were very much a part of the story. And for Monterey, it gave us an opportunity to tell that, that, you know, it, it doesn't have to mean that people have to be excluded from these places. People and wildlife live side by side in a wonderful way in Monterey within protection. You know, that's, that's a great, a great example of what we can do when we put our minds to it. And I think for Chile, um, Patagonia, it's just one of those wonderful stories where it's it's gone beyond just some parks. They're reconnecting parks. They're allowing the wildlife to spread. You know, the concept of rewilding is incredibly important. It's not enough just that we create these tiny little islands um, because otherwise there's no biodiversity, nothing can spread beyond the borders of the park. So reconnecting the parks is such an important thing. We really wanted to highlight that within the series. Um, I don't know if there's anything you'd want to add to that, James. Sorry, I'm just realizing. Yeah, no, I, all I'd say really is that it's not just about conserving wild places, this series. It's really about their growing relevance and value to us and, and our relationship to them. And that's why we wanted to include um, national marine sanctuaries as well as national parks. That's why really this, this series is, is about our relationship with wilderness, because it's not just empty space. It's performing vital functions for us. It's hugely important to us. And, and we, we need to remember that. No, that's very true. And I think within that, you know, what really stood out in, say, like the Monterey Bay example, was, you know, not only do you explain June Bloom, the phenomenon that we have here in California, which I never see, uh, see it explained with that much clarity. So thank you for that. Um, you also really have a sense watching the Monterey Bay episode of a story happening under your feet. You know, when you're watching, say, like the, the baby otter being tucked under the pier, I feel like in that moment, the documentary becomes like, this is not just about globe trotting adventures. This is about appreciating nature that's like literally underneath your feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's only 30 years old. 30 years. If you think of the turnaround between Monterey before and Monterey now, it's an incredible thing. I mean, so I want to really kind of get into like the sense of scale of putting this feat together. I mean, you have five episodes, you hired five directors, you signed each to an episode. What were you looking for in making those choices? You know, both sort of the overall qualities that a director had to have for this series, but also in who paired best with which episode? Um, well, yes, that's a good question. And, and with Natural History, some of our um, assistant producers direct as well. They've directed some of the sequences and even some of the researchers. So we have um, an incredible global team. Some of our core team, including the assistant producer, is Chilean and based in Chile the whole time. So they were working remotely as part of the team. Um, and we were looking for that special blend between storytellers on one hand and people who have an understanding of natural history on the other. It, it's no easy feat to shoot these sequences. It takes a lot of time, a lot of planning. Um, we even, we work with scientists, we storyboard the ideas. And obviously sometimes the wildlife doesn't read the script, but we actually go with a really clear idea of what we're looking for with these films. And to ensure that we have a mixture of light and shade, to make sure that we're reflecting the whole story of each place, it takes a lot of planning. It was three years from, from start to finish, from the day I met James to the day shook his hand as the last one <laughs> was delivered. So yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah, I, and I, you know, sometimes you need real specialists as well. So for the Monterey episode, which is largely underwater, um, and you know all marine really apart from the butterflies uh, and the seals who are on the right on the edge of the coast you know they, the, the um, we needed a director who um, would really understand the complexities of that um, and so we worked with Sarah Connor who who'd been one of our directors on Blue Planet 2 previously um, and brought real expertise to that but they had a tough time you know um, it was a it, Every year is very different in the ocean and you never know quite what to expect. Uh, but of course, um, despite all our best laid plans, um, the pandemic came along. COVID had other plans for us and that kind of changed everything because although we had these great teams and these great directors, as you, as you suggest, um, we were then in a position where global travel just stopped, international travel stopped, and we had to find a way of keep filming. So we actually really lent into the local teams we had 
and, and their qualities, their determination, their patience, their resilience really came through and really shone. You know, just to get cameras up the tops of the mountains in Ganong Losa National Park uh, was a 10 day trek through leech infested rainforest. And, and when the team came back, they were, their clothes were literally dripping with blood. I mean, it was just crazy, the, the hardships they went through to, to, to put remote cameras up on these mountaintops. But they managed to get images of Sumatran tigers, which are one of the rarest creatures on the planet. I mean, um, that feels like it takes such an element of trust, like a leap of faith to be, you know, finding these people when you can't shake hands with them it sounds like in person half the time yeah it, it was a deliberate choice for us i mean as for some natural history programs they parachute in with an in, with their team from their country film and leave we from the very beginning james and i both felt passionately that we wanted to collaborate with local people and to, not only because they have a unique sense of these places um and not just as guides you know having trained team members and we were able um, to use that to incredible effect. As James said, we couldn't have expected the pandemic, but when it hit, we, we, we weren't able to stay in most cases. So they, those guys carried forward and made the films um, and we were directing remotely. We were talking to them, you know, you, in the same way as we are now. It's an, it's an incredible piece of technology and an international cooperation. I'm incredibly proud of what we did because I think it's, it's proven to everyone, including ourselves, just what can be accomplished. I mean, could you, just so I can really get a grasp on it, kind of walk me through an average day coordinating something like this? Like the calls you're making all over the globe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no average day. Um, but uh, if, if we have reception, um, and oh, well, if the team on the ground have reception or availability to get on the internet, we'd use everything from WhatsApp, you know, any app you can think of where we can talk. And then we would talk through the day's rushes the day before. We would look at things via phones. Um, we'd talk about the storyboards. One of the things we did for Gunung Lusa was to build a papier mache replica of the Titan Arum, the giant plant that you see. Um, we built a scale model. We shot it ourselves here and then sent the film low res to the guys on the ground so they could see frame by frame which shots we felt we needed to put that sequence together. And of course, they only have 48 hours from the minute that plant goes to the minute it dies. So they, there's only one chance, you can't muck it up. So, but these guys, they, they took the ball, they even came up with stuff we didn't even think of. Uh, I mean, uh, they, it was incredible. And they were using kit they hadn't used before in some cases, so. Yeah, it's just exceptional. Wait, I am so glad that you brought up the sequence of the corpse flower because I really wanted to get into that with you in detail. I mean, first, yeah, just the timing. This is a flower that blooms for two days every 10 years. You're only working for, on this for three. How did you even time that? Well, you have to look for um, what, what you're actually looking for is a very big leaf in the forest and hopefully the bud of this great flowering structure. And, and if, you, if you find the bud, you know then it's going to happen in the next little while. So then it's just a key, case of keeping an eye on it and, and, um, and you know, predicting, really. Um, and it is amazing because it sort of shoots up, opens out, looks like all this sort of rotting corpse, smells like one, um, lures in all the bugs and, um, and keeps them there for a 24 48 hour period until it runs out of energy and it, and it can't do that again for another decade you know it's amazing <laughs> i mean i'm curious to hear more about like now that i hear that you made a paper mache model i can start to piece it together but i was like how what equipment how did you what what technology did it take to even penetrate the flower without disturbing any of the insect pollinators and you and it's and you were talking about how it gets so warm inside the flower, which seems like a whole other dimension of like figuring out how to shoot this. Well, a lot of the tech now is, is um, including things like Laura probes are very long and thin. So it's almost like the same sort of technology that you're using when you have a camera and swallow a camera when they're checking inside you. So we, we can be minimal um, and we don't need to affect the heat of, of what we're filming either because there's no heat coming off the light. So anything that, that we do, we can we work around and we plan that as part of the planning 
before we interact with anything, whether it's a plant or an animal, because, you know, for example, with the slow loris, you couldn't put a bright light near its eyes because it would be terrible for it. So we, we plan all of that into our um, early research stage, including danger as well, you know, what we might run into, what all of the various things that, that could get you in the jungle, as James rightly said. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot of planning um, and weaving all of that around the narrative at the heart of the, the series. I mean, I have to know a little bit more about this danger. Well, it, most of the dangers, to be honest, on location tend not to be the wildlife. I think people always think about the snakes or the tigers, and definitely you have to think about those things. But it, it's more the extremes of heat and cold. Um, and th those are the things that we have to think about very carefully. Uh, and that applies to the dive team being underwater for too long. It, it could be any any number of ways that can affect us. So all of that goes into, into the planning and, uh, as well. I mean, you do get to show off that some of your camera equipment is tiger proof. Um, but did you have any camera equipment that was destroyed? Um, I think I think some things took a fair pounding, mainly weather. Uh, the tiger did have a bit of a chew on the... Um, <laughs> On some of the scientists, I think there were some of the scientists actually as well had some some equipment out there that they'd uh, found and had a good chew on. But at least it proves they're there as well. You know, that it's it's quite any signs of those animals is is very precious. I mean, now that I'm learning a little bit more about how you have like a very long and skinny microscopic camera, it helps me make sense of how you got the shot of say like going inside of a sloth's fur to capture the moths living in there, which is just astounding but I imagine like this type of of filmmaking it seems very much for the two of you that about like having to stay current on the latest technology perhaps even figuring out how to develop or tweak technology to suit what you need yeah I mean I think we used over 20 different sorts of cameras on on the, on the series but you also have to keep across all the latest science because um you know there's new discoveries being made all the time new scientific insights into the creatures we're filming and and we want to wherever possible, reflect that. And then sometimes we get really lucky and we get to make a bit of science ourselves, uh, like we did when we found the hammerhead worm in Losa, um, that, that disgusting creature that crawls along the forest floor and devours slugs and snails um, so and gulps shiny. them. With a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so shiny. Like a um, like yeah, but with a, with, a, with a mouth in the middle of its stomach and it's sort of, ah, oh, it's just an extraordinary creature. Um, but that's a, you know, that, that particular type of hammerhead worm appears to be new to science and appears to be a new species which is you know amazing and just goes to show actually how rich these rainforests are and once you start scrabbling about looking in the dark corners you'll find something that no one's ever seen before um and, and that's really exciting and similarly when we were in 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 kenya and savo um the dwarf mongooses the way they were opening those african land snails smashing them in a sort of american football throw between their legs uh, against tree tree roots behind that is new behavior and um, hadn't been recorded there with that species before. So that was like, well, you know, someone's interested in that. The, the, where where the, um, uh, the sea otter was stashing her baby in Moss Landing under the, under the boardwalk, that, was, uh, that hadn't been recorded before either. So really, when you begin to look and you begin to spend time with these creatures, it's amazing how often they do begin to yield new secrets. And, and that's always so exciting for us. Right, I mean, that seems like part of the conversation to have with the camera crew ahead of time that you had to do to figure out, I mean, to shoot these many setups, you know, in this small of amount of time feels like there is some time pressure, but also how do you find that balance and like knowing the story that you want to go after, the animal story that you think you're going to capture by showing up at this moment, and then having the flexibility to be open to the serendipity of finding like, you know, a macaque riding a deer and just letting your camera crew go and follow that story for a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's it's something that, um, as I said, said before, we often plan for everything, but sometimes it, it changes when you're there and you, you get something totally unexpected. And then it's all about communication. You know, we just all come together and we talk about what we've got uh, and what, what we're gonna do with it, how it will sit in the film, but also how it will affect the other films, because we don't wanna be telling a story that's in another film 
already, or if we found something that was in another film here, then we're going to have to change that film. And, and that's um, something that as a team, we were really cohesive. And that's even as a global team, everybody was supporting each other's films in a brilliant way. All of the producers um, were just, it, yeah, it's just working together to get the job done. And uh, yeah, it was, it was so much fun. <laughs> It was I really mean, good fun. The episode, I think, um, I was really curious about in terms of like the editing and sort of the decision is is episode one, you know, which I think has like the least obvious structure because it's sort of like a an appetite wetter for what's to come. Like, how did you decide just to structure that episode itself? What would be included? How to arrange the segments? Um, well, we had we had this idea of uh, the points we needed the film to make. So it's, it's essentially a story of thirds. The first third is designed to make you fall in love with national parks and just realize what incredible, wonderful places they are. Um, and then the midsection helps you to realize that they're, just, they're not just beautiful places, wonderful animals. They actually perform hugely important services for us globally, whether it's cleaning air, water, um, as a place for medicines. And then in the in the latter half, we sort of start to tease up the latter third, sorry, uh, tease up what's going to come ahead. And we look at some of the problems and some of the issues and why we're telling this story now. And uh, I think the nuances of it went back and forwards between James and I and the producer and, and uh, the former president as well and, and his his team, Higher Ground. And, and then you come up with this uh, introduction, if you like, but also a truly global film that rep just represents how incredible and how global the series will be. That's the idea anyway. <laughs> there's that a, there's always a lot to set up in, a, in, a, in an opening episode, isn't there? You know, especially when we have um, you know, stellar new talent and um, so many things we need, we need to remind people about. You know, the, the, the fact that National Parks is actually a really recent phenomenon and and the global movement you know half of all national parks have been founded in the last 50 years for example um so you have to set some sort of context but really this is a forward-facing series where we try and tell the story of each place through the eyes of its wildest creatures its animal inhabitants and and so we want to show what's special about these different places through the uh, through the experiences of, of of the creatures that live there I mean, um, and at the same time, we have to remind ourselves of, of the purpose of all this wilderness, why it's important to us and why we need an ongoing relationship with it. So that I suppose that is, you know, a, a, a more challenging narrative than, than a trip around a, a region or, or a park like some of the other episodes. Uh, but each one of those is chosen because they're so iconic and, and they're not necessarily the most famous um, globally, but they are iconic places and places that deserve our recognition and hopefully our love and, and our aim was to um, to help viewers connect and care about these places and the animals that live within them because we're at a really tough time and and um, the, the the conservation story around national parks is one of the the the, the great conservation success stories of our time and in a world where we're struggling with the climate crisis uh, with the biodiversity crisis the extinctions that are happening or, or with the escalating pollution crisis you know th this stands out as a as a as a story that we could tell that would be purposefully hopeful um, and give us a sense of agency and help us realize that if we get involved um, and get behind these places and get behind the importance of wilderness, um, then maybe we could help make, make things a bit better. Right, because in that episode, you're also going to some of um, the most polluted places or places I think really represent what pollution looks like on this globe. How, how was it getting access to those places? Um. I think you can usually get access as long as you put in the time and explain to people what it is you're trying to show. I mean, for and, and it, it's again, it comes down to planning and preparation, really. It, I think everything changed for us with the COVID pandemic and some of the places that we were planning to go to, we didn't go to um, because we couldn't. 
because the, the situation there was was too bad or um and that that so the films changed even as we went through uh, over the three years so we, we swapped stories in and out and countries in and out and parks in and out as well so that's true and, and to james's point you know i mean it feels like you know over like over the time that you've worked in nature documentaries one of the shifts i feel like i've seen in audience you know in sort of how they're presented is it, it they, it's now so necessary to talk about climate change it's just so necessary to talk about the, the problems happening in the world that like it is true that I think sometimes um, a format that used to only be sort of beautiful uplifting background stuff has to also get into material that people find depressing and I like I know that hope was important to you but like how how do you create hope in this well, we should have hope because we have agency because it's not too late it's about acting now and that's again really why we wanted to tell the series was because um wilderness is important and we need to care about it and we need to we need to get involved and act now and, and that's why we also created a digital campaign that sticks alongside the the tv series so that for viewers who felt they were moved by this enough to want to take action there's actually um, a route towards that that you can take. And if they log on to wildforall.org, they can find out more, more information. So, um, you know, that, 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 that was really hoping to lead viewers from um, watching the films, connecting emotionally, coming to care for the creatures and the faces towards taking direct action for themselves. I imagine that was one of the conversations that you had with the president about what kind of a documentary series he wanted to to put his name on. Or well, to I think. Was... Sorry, James. No, I was just going to say it felt like a very natural fit to tell this story of the importance of wilderness. I think that's the point. And with, and with some of the um, areas of concern, to come back to your previous questions in terms of uh, footage of devastation some of that that material we were able to get from um archive as well you know we we didn't have to go and film every everything on, on from the outside the natural heart park space but um i think it was set, he had a very clear the former president had a very clear idea of the points he wanted to bring up and the the things he wanted to land and and that's reflected quite a lot in throughout and in his speech at the end I would love to talk about like your collaboration with him on the script. You know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, specifically you're having our former president talk about things like llamas having sex and how do you put these words in his mouth? Um, <laughs> uh, how do we I mean, I think, well, James is, uh, has all the experience in, in natural history over me, but I mean, it's the same process as with uh, working with Sir David Attenborough you know that these subjects are delicate and they um require gentle handling but because we want these programs to be enjoyed by people with their children you know families together but at the same time it, it's the natural world and you just you just take a very straight line and you explain what's happening um and try not to make silly silly comments but i think uh occasionally we were a bit too British and used British words and <laughs> changed it. I think there was a line talking about the Nisia fruit that the orangutan in um, that the, they pick and they use a tool to get the hairs out and we described it as about the size of an American football and he had a wry smile and said it's it's just a football because <laughs> to us it's a soccer ball is a football but uh, yeah there were a few things like that but uh, it's, it was a very easy process where we'd Let's talk about the the themes we talk about sequences we'd write what where we thought and then we send it off and then get comments back and we do that a few times all the way through the edit really and even in the voiceover didn't he james he had a few changes oh yeah yeah but it was uh, it was a, it was um, a lot of fun writing the scripts together we'd we'd um the, the way the president wanted to us to do it was was really for us to work as we would normally which is to write the uh, the commentary that would go through many passes and then when the time was right right we'd present it to him um and and then of course uh, you know he would um want to to change some some lines into his own words and add uh, some personal 
uh, additions, all of which helped, all of which made it funnier. And it was, it was actually great fun going into those commentary records. We did them down the line, um, one, one film at a time. And um, it was always, um, he always came very well prepared and um, you know, he's got such mastery over his own voice. And I think uh, for people who love to hear him speak, it was a real joy. It's true, though. I'd like to imagine, and I can't decide if I want you to dispel this imagination in my head of him easing into doing his first nature documentary by, to me, mimicking one of the one of the two great nature voices, Attenborough, of course, or like Werner Herzog. I want to imagine him easing into it by joking around a little bit on the mic. <laughs> I think he just, you know, he's he's he, he knew how he wanted to do it, and in he strode and. Boom, we kicked off. There wasn't much hanging around or warming up or getting into it. It just, he, he just started delivering great lines. He's very good with the comedy. I, I don't know how you found that, but he's got that, that sort of warm, playful sense, which I think he does so well. Uh, brings a new element to some of these stories that, that brings them alive in a, in a really um, accessible and engaging way. And at the same time, in other stories where there's tension and hunts, He's got, he's got quite a big range um, of emotions that he can bring through a film, which is, again, it really helps when you're trying to engage people who perhaps don't normally watch natural history, who, who wouldn't be um, your average audience member. And that was something, you know, we, we had this opportunity here to reach a new audience, perhaps people who wouldn't normally have watched these kind of shows. Um, and it's such an important thing to have that chance. And I think he brought loads to the party. I appreciated his, his voice when he got very coy. I think that was my favorite note that he did. <laughs> but um, you know, I was thinking, you know, it's true. I think one of the noteworthy things I noticed watching this is like, yes, it's rated like TV PG for fear, but I felt like you made a choice to show more of the life of animals and less sort of hunting and death. There wasn't, I think as much like blood as sometimes I think there have been in nature documentaries. Was that a deliberate choice? Um. There's so many amazing stories to tell, and predation is often a very small part of an animal's behavioural repertoire. Um, and um, yeah, we, we we want this series to be accessible and relatable. We didn't want it to be all blood and guts. Why would we? Um, we sometimes, you know, uh, animals do kill, and when they do, we want to represent it sensitively, um, and we don't want to over sanitise it. Um, but we don't want to make it over dramatic either. You know, it's it's about it's about being um, representing it as we did with, uh, for example, the orca family when they when they ambush the the, the grey whales in in the Monterey episode. But but animals do so many more things, and you get such a broader range of emotional responses as a viewer when you see animals doing surprising things like hippos surfing. I mean, how cool is that, right? You're, not, you're going to have a very different emotional reaction as a viewer to that than you would do of something trying to chase and eat the hippo. So it's, uh, it's really about um, you know, representing the, the full breadth of what happens in nature, I think. I think with the... Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. I, I think we, when we went to film the rhino at night, we, we knew that they would come to the waterhole, um, and we, we had these incredible cameras that would allow us to see into the darkness in color, but none of us went in there expecting to see something uh, like that male attacking the, the young female rhino. And um, how, how you handle that or whether you choose to use that. And we felt it was important to show that, um, but also to show that she managed to outfox him. She managed to get away and in this, um, but it is, it's partly a reflection of the success of the park that there are more rhino coming together and rhino are notoriously grumpy folk at the best of times. Um, but yes, that, that kind of level of drama where your heart is in your mouth can only be sustained for so long without losing some of the audience. And we wanted to take everybody on a journey. So yeah, there's light and shade through every film. Um, yeah. I know. I'm glad that, that you brought up both that footage with, which had that great sort of colorized black and white or black colorized nighttime footage. And also the, the surfing hippos, because I wanted to, you know, kind of maybe use that example 
to try to understand the pre-planning that went into setting up the cameras. Because watching that, I was like, okay, there's cameras here, there's cameras here, possibly underwater, maybe aerial drone. Like, what is this pre-planning and getting everybody set up? How much of a crew does it take to get, say, just talking about the hippo surfing sequence? Uh, that was... Go on, sorry, go on, James. I was just going to say, first, you've got to find them. That's uh, Narango National Park. And um, just finding... Um, hippos along that 40 mile stretch of beach where there's no one is uh, is quite tough <laughs> um, and then when you do you've got to work out what their routes are where they're going what their behavior sort of timetable is but they actually can be quite um quite predictable animals uh, and we started to see patterns and then once you've got the patterns of behavior you can then work out how to film it but we certainly employed drones we had uh, cameras in, in waterproof housings uh, and then of course long lens um, but they're not used to seeing people so you've got to keep you've got to keep at a distance um, for a lot of it as well because uh, um, you know there, there aren't really many people there at all but um, the good thing is, if you if you employ your field craft, then the animals will be relaxed and go about their uh, daily lives, which in this case for this particular hippo, who's surfing up and down the beach, catching the waves, using the swell to get to his grazing grounds, um, he just let us in and we were able to film, film the whole story. What footage do you think, for the, each of you, are you most proud of that when you saw it, you were just like, oh, that is my moment in this whole series? Um, I think for me, probably the Deccan's Shafaka with the leaping lemurs from Madagascar, that the world, that sort of cast rock formations, it looks like outer space, it's like a um, whole new realm, um, but also to film in that is incredibly complex because that, that's razor sharp and without the latest uh, tech we wouldn't be able to do it, but it was just an incredible sequence where you understand um, why it, those animals have to get from A to B, but also why they've somehow been naturally protected because people can't get to them so easily where they are and they're protected within the national park. But that that story of them, the, that family was incredible. And I had my heart in my mouth, even when we'd seen it a few times in the edit and we'd <laughs> cut it and recut it. I still found myself getting nervous in some of those shots. So uh, um, James, which is what's your favorite one? Well, I don't know. I, I, I tend to love whatever animal I've just met and filmed, whether it's a whale or a wasp, it doesn't matter. It's, it, you, once you get to know them and you, you discover the, the challenges they as individuals face and you can begin to empathize with that, you're drawn into their world. Um, I love meeting the puma in the Patagonia episode who has cubs to feed and is desperately trying to successfully hunt, but failing. And there's that incredible chase with Hanukkah, which is just an extraordinary piece of behavior to have captured. That was amazing. Um, but how cool is it to see juvenile great white sharks just off the coast of California? Um, it's brilliant to spend time with the cute sea otters. Um, to see a Sumatran tiger in the wild is, is a thrill. Um, you know, there's there's many things, but I think the surfing hippos is probably a favorite for me because I know how hard it is to film. I, I have tried to film it before um, with Sir David Attenborough, um, but we we got much better shots this time and it was really worth going back and getting done properly. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> that makes me feel as though the life of being a, a nature documentarian is never ending. You're always like, oh, but can I go back and get another shot of this? Oh, can I do it just a little bit better? It, it seems to be its own unique challenge to the field. Well, there's always new equipment coming out, new technology that allows you to film things differently or possibly better. You talked about the, the, the night vision cameras that are so light sensitive that they can even film in color uh, under the light of the full moon, which is amazing. Um, you know, we didn't have those 10 years ago and they make a huge difference. Um, to what we can see and to what we can capture. Um, and those sorts of technologies, uh, as they come out, they allow us to tell stories in different ways. And as new science comes out, we, we find there are new revelations, new stories to tell. And there are still new behaviors that are only being discovered for the first time. And there are still new species being discovered for the first time. And so all those things give us, uh, yeah, give us hope that we haven't run out of creatures to film yet. <laughs> I mean, for the two of you, after this, where do you both now 
where are you both itching to go? What are you itching to learn more about that you haven't had a chance to fully dive into yet? Well, we're, we're mostly concentrating on on um, on this series at the moment and uh, and and just getting it out. But uh, we have a I have a uh, uh, another ocean series that we're working on at the moment. So we're spending a lot of time underwater um, as well, which is um, which is you know, very challenging and exciting, um, and a place where there's lots of new science and lots of new discoveries. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we've got to keep busy because there's the, it's so important to keep nature. Um, front and center in people's minds. It's so important to stimulate conversations around important issues. Um, and sometimes the, the, the subjects that are, that are most important are quite challenging. You know, biodiversity as an idea is, is difficult sometimes for, 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 to be accessible to people. But if you can start thinking about wild places and their importance, the, the homes of these wild animals, then it, you know, it's one way of doing that. Um, and I think it's, uh, I, I, what we try and do as we choose the next film is, is see where um, can we bring a real purpose to our storytelling and use our skills as wildlife filmmakers to hopefully draw people's attention and turn the conversation towards some of these issues that will ultimately affect us all. I love that. Well, I know that we should wrap up, but I do have to say, you were telling me right when we were starting this conversation that there is one other fan group of this documentary that I have to ask you about, which is <laughs> House Pets. This is a very popular show for house pets. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know quite how it has become so, so, so trending as much as it as it as it has been, but it, it began it almost immediately on the first night that it went up onto Netflix. I started to get pictures from friends saying that their pet or was particularly uh, dogs and cats were trying to to watch the show um, almost sat on front of, in front of their owners intently watching. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. J James, you've got a dog. It is uh, a, a big fan. Um, I, a moderate fan, but there's a lot of wildlife on in my telly, so in my house. So he probably gets a little bit, you know, blasé about it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a massive Maine Coon kitten and he was obsessed with the Pumas. You made a very big impression. <laughs> Little life gave him some terrible ideas. <laughs> Better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been such a fun conversation. I want to thank you both for being here again. James Honeyborn, Sophie Todd, thank you so much for talking to us about this series. It's just really a great watch. And of course, thank you again, Andrea. We really appreciate you for being our lovely conversation host and interpreter at the bottom. Um, please join us for more of these conversations at the IDA Awards Spotlight Series. We are, again, at www.documentary.org slash awards spotlight. Um, we hope to see you back there. And uh, it's always a pleasure talking documentaries with you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you both. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Andrea. Bye.